Every portrait that is painted with feeling is a portrait of the artist, not of the sitter. The sitter is merely the accident, the occasion. It is not he who is revealed by the painter. It is rather the painter who, on the colored canvas, uh, reveals himself. The, the reason I will not exhibit this picture is that I am afraid that I have shown with it the secret of my own soul. Lord Harry laughed. <laughs> and what is that? he asked. I will tell you, said Holward. An expression of perplexity came over his face. I'm all expectation, Basil, murmured his companion, looking at him. Oh, there is really very little to tell, Harry, answered the young painter, and I'm afraid you will hardly understand it. Perhaps you will hardly believe it. Lord Henry smiled, and, leaning down, plucked a pink-petaled daisy from the grass, and examined it. "'I'm quite sure I shall understand it,' he replied, gazing intently at the little golden white feathered disk. "'And I can believe anything, provided that it is incredible.' The wind shook some blossoms from the trees, and the heavy lilac blooms, with their clustering stars, moved to and fro in the languid air. A grasshopper began to chirp in the grass, and a long, thin dragonfly floated by on its own brown gauze wings. Lord Henry felt as if he could hear Basil Hallward's heart beating, and wondered what was coming. "'Well, this is incredible,' repeated Hallward, rather bitterly. "'Incredible to me at times.' I don't know what it means. The story is simply this. Two months ago I went to a crush at Lady Brandon's. You know we poor painters have to show ourselves in society from time to time, just to remind the public that we are not savages. With an evening coat and a white tie, as you once told me, anybody, even a stockbroker, can gain a reputation for being civilized. Well, after I'd been in the room about ten minutes, talking to huge overdressed dowagers and tedious academicians, I suddenly became conscious that someone was looking at me. I turned halfway round and saw Doreen Gray for the first time. When our eyes met, I felt that I was growing pale. A curious instinct of terror came over me. I knew that I had come face to face with someone whose mere personality was so fascinating that, if I allowed it to do so, it would absorb my whole nature, my whole soul, my very art itself. I did not want any external influence in my life. You know yourself, Harry, how independent I am by nature. My father destined me for the army. I insisted on going to Oxford. Then he made me enter my name at the Middle Temple. Before I had eaten half a dozen dinners, I gave up the bar and announced my intention of becoming a painter. I have always been my own master. Had at least always been so till I met Dorian Gray. And then, but I don't know how to explain it to you. Something seemed to tell me that I was on the verge of a terrible crisis in my life. I had a strange feeling that fate had in store for me exquisite joys and exquisite sorrows. I knew that if I had spoke to Dorian, I would become absolutely devoted to him, and that I ought not to speak to him. I grew afraid, and turned to quit the room. It was not conscience that made me do so. It was cowardice. I take no credit to myself for trying to escape. Conscience and cowardice are really the same things, Basil. Conscience is the trade name of the firm, that is all. I don't believe that, Harry. However, whatever my motive, and it may have been pride, for I used to be very proud, I certainly struggled to the door, there, of course, 
I stumbled against Lady Brandon. "'You are not going to run away so soon, Mr. Hallward?' she screamed out. "'You know her shrill, horrid voice.' "'Yes, she is a peacock in everything but beauty,' said Lord Henry, pulling the daisy to bits with his long, nervous fingers. "'I could not get rid of her. "'She brought me up to royalties, and people with stars and garters, "'and elderly ladies with gigantic tiaras and hooked noses. "'She spoke of me as her dearest friend. "'I had only met her once before, but she took it into her head to lionize me. "'I believe some picture of mine had made a great success at the time, "'at least had been chattered about in the penny newspapers.' which is the nineteenth-century standard of immortality. Suddenly, I found myself face to face with a young man whose personality had so strangely stirred me. We were quite close, almost touching. Our eyes met again. It was mad of me, but I asked Lady Brandon to introduce me to him. Perhaps it was not so mad, after all. It was simply inevitable. We would have spoken to each other without any introduction, I'm sure of that. Dorian told me so afterwards. He, too, felt that we were destined to know each other. And how did Lady Brandon describe this wonderful young man? I know she goes in for giving rapid precis of all her guests. I, I remember her bringing me to a most truculent and red-faced old gentleman, covered all over with orders and ribbons, and hissing into my ear, and... A tragic whisper, which must have been perfectly audible to everyone in the room, something like, Sir Humpty Dumpty, you know, Afghan frontier, Russian intrigues, very successful men, wife killed by an elephant, quite inconsolable, wants to marry a beautiful American widow, everybody does nowadays, hates Mr. Gladstone, but very much interested in Beatles. Ask him what he thinks of Shuvalov. I simply fled. I like to find out people for myself, but Lady Brandon treats her guests exactly as an auctioneer treats his goods. She either explains them entirely away, or tells everyone everything about them, except what one wants to know. But what did she say about Mr. Dorian Gray? Oh, she murmured, "'Charming boy, poor dear mother and I, quite inseparable, engaged to be married to the same man. I, I mean, married on the same day. <laughs> How very silly of me. Quite forget what he does. Afraid he uh, doesn't do anything. Oh, yes, yes, plays the piano. Uh, or is it the violin, dear Mr. Gray?' We could neither of us help laughing, and we became friends at once. "'Laughter is not a bad beginning for a friendship, and it is the best ending for one.' said Lord Henry, plucking another daisy. Hallward buried his face in his hands. "'You don't understand what friendship is, Harry,' he murmured. "'Or what enmity is, for that matter. You like everyone. Well, that is to say, you are indifferent to everyone.' "'How horribly unjust of you!' cried Lord Henry, tilting his hat back and looking at the little clouds that were drifting across the hollow turquoise of the summer sky like raveled skeins of glossy white silk. Yes, horribly unjust of you. I make a great difference between people. I choose my friends for their good looks, my acquaintances for their characters, and my enemies for their brains. A man can't be too careful in the choice of his enemies. I have not got one who is a fool. They are all men of some intellectual power, and consequently they all appreciate me. Is that very vain of me? I think it is rather vain. I should think it was, Harry, but according to your category I must merely be an acquaintance. My dear old Basil, you are much more than an acquaintance. And much less a friend, a sort of brother, I suppose. Oh, brothers! <laughs> I don't care for brothers. My elder brother won't die, and my younger brothers seem never to do anything else. Harry! My dear fellow, I am not quite serious. 
but I can't help detesting my relations. I suppose it comes from the fact that we can't stand other people having the same faults as ourselves. I quite sympathize with the rage of the English democracy against what they call the vices of the upper classes. They feel that drunkenness, stupidity, and immorality should be their own special property, and that if any one of us makes an ass of himself, he is poaching on their preserves. When poor Southwark got into the divorce court, their indignation was quite magnificent. And yet I don't suppose that ten percent of the lower orders live correctly. I don't agree with a single word that you have said, and what is more, Harry, I don't believe you do either. Lord Henry stroked his pointed brown beard and tapped the toe of his patent leather boot with a tasseled malacca cane. How English you are, Basil! 